Um, so welcome. Welcome everyone to the Managing for Wildlife workshop. This is the uh, first of our virtual Forester North Carolina meetings. And we are very excited to kick off this series. And it's wonderful to see so many folks joining us today. It looks like right now we've got close to 100 people. So that is wonderful to see. My name is Jennifer Roach, and I'm a district forester here with the North Carolina Forest Service out of Hillsboro, and I will be your moderator today. Um, and we have some very exciting updates that we wanted to share before we went any further. Uh, we are happy to say that we now have a Facebook page. So if you are a social media person, you can search for Forest Her NC. Uh, adding the NC, the North Carolina at the end is important. And you can find our uh, Facebook page. It is open to the public, open to anyone to see it. You can like us and you can follow us on there. Um, if you wanna receive great updates, hopefully some fun facts, that's a great page to go to. Uh, we also have a, you can join our Facebook group. So for those of you that are not as savvy uh, with Facebook as maybe some of the younger crowd, um, Facebook group is an opportunity for, it's a private group, so you have to ask to join it. You ask, answer a few questions, just kind of the rules of the group. And it's a great space to kind of come together, ask questions, to kind of start a conversation, or if you're looking for assistance, it's just a great opportunity to connect with each other, with other women that may be near you or maybe across the state, but maybe have some of the same questions that you might. So. Um, you can try to search that on Facebook, um, Forest Her NC again, but we've also know that some folks have had trouble with that. So we do have a link and we will be sending, it looks like Laurel has posted the link in the chat box, but we will also be sending the link out by email as well. And you can also follow us on Instagram. So if you like Instagram, you can do Forest Her NC on that as well. And of course we do have our email. So if you did not receive an email today about this meeting, but would like to receive updates in the future, uh, then please uh, send us an email and we can get you on our email list, sir. Uh, keep in mind, check your spam box before you send us an email to make sure that our emails weren't going into there first. We've had a lot of trouble with that. So check your spam. And hopefully soon, coming real soon, we'll have a Force Her NC website up and running. And once we get that, that will be the one-stop shopping place that you can go and find our Facebook group. You can find us on Instagram and we'll start to share some of our updates, upcoming workshops, as well as some of the previous materials that were at some of our previous workshops. So we are excited to have that once that gets kicked off. All right, so I'll leave that up for a little bit. Um, so just to kind of start moving forward, um, when we started talking about moving to a virtual meeting or virtual series, uh, we felt like we needed to, we looked at this meeting as an opportunity to maybe come back to center, to come back and refresh, and to kind of remind everyone why Forrester North Carolina is important, why we're here, kind of how we got here, and uh, most importantly, look at some of the impacts that Forrester North Carolina has had so far. And um, so, we're gonna start off and talk about that first. Um, most people probably do not know that Forest Herd North Carolina started with two women talking with two more women, talking with two more women. Uh, women that all wanted to do something similar to this, but just weren't sure how to get it going. And they got a bunch of other women in a room and we all asked the question, can we make this happen? And we wondered if we'll have the support from our state and federal agencies, our forestry and consulting firms and nonprofit groups and other conservation groups in North Carolina. And our response was overwhelming. And um, so we have had a great response to that. And we are very excited, very excited to be able to work together and be able to provide programs like this. Um, just a, a quick Forester's mission is here to support educate and empower women, landowners, and natural resource professionals to engage in forest conservation and land stewardship in North Carolina. We have an executive board, bylaws, committees, multiple committees, and we are always looking for your help. So if you're out there today and you're thinking, how can I get involved? I'd like to participate. 
or if you feel like you just want to support force her in some form or fashion or have something to offer um, or if you just want to talk with us to share your story maybe you have a, a story about some of the the troubles or woes or, or questions you might have had in land and land management and conservation um, we would love to hear from you so please feel free shoot us an email and uh and tell us uh how we could help so without further delay it looks like it is time for our first speaker and jennifer we have so a question I, yes um people are wondering if forest her is available in any other states Oh, yes. So um, there are definitely other states that have women landowner groups. Now, they all may be, since they're different states, the states all may have a different name. In, um, I believe, Alabama, there is a, another forest herd that I think is from Alabama. There are, in Georgia, it's called Land and Ladies. And, um, but yes, there are other states. They're just a little bit, they're just named differently. But they are still um, educational programs that are seeking women to try to help women through the process of land conservation, forest management, wildlife management, and managing land. So, yes. All right, any more questions so far? Uh, once again, please feel free to type those questions in um, as the presentations go along. Uh, we will probably wait to the end to answer most of those or the end of each presentation to answer most of those, but please put them in there as you get them and we will go through there. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jennifer Fawcett with the North Carolina NC State Extension. And she is going to share with us the importance of engaging women in land ownership and stewardship. So with that, Jennifer Fawcett, I'll turn it over to you. And as Jennifer mentioned, um, my name is Jennifer Fawcett. I work at NC State Extension. I want to thank everyone first for joining this webinar and for having me on today. Um, in addition to working for NC State Extension Forestry, I also volunteer on the board of Forester NC. So for those of you who didn't know, like Jennifer mentioned, um, this is a group that's volunteer based. And so uh, we would encourage all of you to join and participate as you're able. And for those of you who didn't know, this is actually, this is the first of a four part wildlife series taking place over the next four months. So it was originally supposed to be held in person in March, um, but as you know, things have changed a little bit since then. So we're definitely glad that you are here with us today. Um, we wanted to kick off the series by giving you just a little bit of background on women who own woodlands in North Carolina and also about the Forest Herd North Carolina Network. So I'm gonna start us off here. You should see a picture of a map right now, who owns America's forest, correct? Yes, that looks great. Great, thank you. So to kick us off, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of who actually does own America's Forest and kind of start from a, a big picture. So the colors are a little bit small to see here, but um, in general, green is that family forest owned land, blue is corporate, and that pinkish color is other private. So you can see in the this part of the country, it's actually mostly family owned, privately owned forests. Um, and that's important because the, the privately owned forests are working forests that benefit all of us. So the private forests supply almost 30% of the water we drink, as well as clean air and fish and wildlife habitat, um, recreation opportunities. It also provides more than 90% of our forest products, including timber to build homes and fuel wood for heating them, um, supports lots of jobs, and then contributes to our nation's energy, security, housing, infrastructure. So lots of reasons to have forests and um, they are mostly family forest owned in the South. So in North Carolina, um, we actually are a majority owned privately owned forest. So um, we, we do have some federal public property and state owned property, but a lot of our forests are private. And so I just, um, I, I wanted to see where you all were from to see how that kind of overlaid with this map. And um, so all of those little dots 
are who you are. So we had almost 300 people register for this event today from six different states. So one of those little dots is you. Uh, today's topic will be mostly focused on North Carolina, but um, we had people from other states. So, and as somebody asked before, if there's forest here in other states, you know, if you're not from North Carolina, please do check to see if your state has one because there are other states out there um, actually quite a few states that do have other women's programs like Forest Her. And there's actually an entire national network um, called Women Owning Woodlands. And they have a website with uh, all sorts of really great resources kind of from a national level. And so there's, a, there's an entire network of women professionals and landowners out there. So I encourage you to try to join that. So the question is, is why women? So before I share some information about Forest Her NC, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on why women's focused programming is so important. So women's focused programming um, has actually, it's been around for decades. So we are not the first ones here in North Carolina to create this. Um, there's been lots of other programs before us. And in North Carolina, there's actually been quite a few programs in the past as well. So why a focus on women? Well, um, Though a similar proportions of men and women hope to inf inherit their family forest land, so you can kind of see that in the graphic on the right, um, pretty close, m men and women all hope to do that. But when you look at how many actually participate in forest management, almost 20% fewer women than men have actually been involved in the management of their forests. Um, so that's important because women are a large and a growing part of the landowner population. So in the US, private families and individuals own almost 60% of the forest land that's nationwide. Of this, the percentage of family forest ownerships were women, um, it was the owner and the primary decision maker actually doubled from 11% in 2006 to 22% in 2013. So these women, which may include you, uh, make decisions for 44 million acres of America's family forest land. And also women usually rent, represent half of joint ownerships. So that um, is potentially the contributions to the choices made on many more million acres than that even. Women also care about the health, beauty, and impact of their land. So from surveys, the main reasons that women own their land are, are beauty and wildlife habitat, nature protection, legacy, water protection. And women tend to see their land for its, its holistic value in terms of benefits for the environment, the community, and the economy. So, but despite this, um, as we see, women are significantly less likely than men to participate in management activities. But women will likely make the final land use decision. So this is just facts, but in the US, women tend to outlive men. So this, is, this means that it's likely that final land use decisions, including selling or dividing land, will actually be made by women. So it's really important that women be involved in understanding the management and understanding more about their land. Okay, hey, research has shown that the challenges of land ownership are more significant for women than for men. Um, despite this, outreach efforts to engage landowners and forest management programs um, hasn't been as successful for women. And that's, women usually cite lack of knowledge as their primary barrier to owning forest land, but they might not attend conventional programming because they feel like it's not necessarily directed toward them. So developing programs like Forest Her that are geared towards women, where women feel comfortable to ask questions and share goals and practice technical skills, provide those much needed opportunities for women to gain that knowledge and confidence that leads to empowered and, and informed land management decisions. So the Women Owning Woodland Network that I mentioned before is a national network that, um, that tries to do that. And uh, the WOW network can connect you to training workshops across the country. And that's also part of what we're trying to do here as part of Forest Her NC. 
So in North Carolina specifically, here's some of our demographics. Um, I just wanted to share this with you. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can kind of read them on your own. So these are the demographics as to who owns our forest land. And according to the National Woodland Owner Survey across the nation, women uh, manage, let's see here, that um, women manage a, a lot of property and represent 16% of all woodland owners. And most importantly, that number of women woodland owners is expected to increase. So in North Carolina, that graphic on the right, you can see our, our numbers are actually even higher than that. 31% um, of the forest land is actually um, managed and owned by women. So one, so, um, some women woodland owners are not as familiar with managing their woodlands as men. Others are very comfortable with managing theirs or an active in all aspects of managing their property. So it's, it, it varies. We at, um, at Forest Her, it's, you know, regardless of your experience with woodland management, if you're very experienced or maybe this, you're just starting out, um, we're hopefully hoping that this program will help everybody in, everybody in between. So here are the partners that that Forester NC is comprised of as of now. Um, so these are the members of the executive board that Jennifer mentioned earlier. So all of the partners shown here, as well as a private landowner, make up that um, that partnership. These eight agencies have contributed their staff time and money. Uh, also, several agencies to provide funding to support our work. You can see those here. And of course, there's lots of other agencies and organizations who are serving on our committees. They're devoting their time and their energy to the program. And then there's even more people uh, from a wide variety of organizations, such as Ecoforesters, the Duke Forest, different consulting forestry professionals um, who have supported our program by giving presentations at our workshops. So we definitely want to thank everyone who's been involved thus far. If you or your agency want to become involved some way, please don't be shy. Um, there's lots of opportunities to become involved by joining one of our committees, by giving a presentation, by liking the Facebook page, by joining our Facebook group, or you know, helping out in other ways. So some of the goals of our group are to provide um, scientifically based forest stewardship information. Also to connect women with each other and resources in their communities, you know, during this virtual time now that's a little bit harder, but that's hopefully what our um, new social media will be doing and pretty soon we're going to have a website to help with that as well. To build a community of women landowners and natural resource professionals. So today I did talk quite a bit about women landowners, but we're also hoping to build that community with the natural resource professionals as well, in addition to landowners. And finally, to have a positive impact on the ground conservation on private lands across North Carolina. So what have we done so far? Um, last year, we held six workshops in, uh, in 2019, we held well, it was two different workshops, two different topics, but in three locations across the state. So the first one was about getting to know your land, and the second was managing your woodlands. So these are the topics that we still have left. Right now, we are in the Managing for Wildlife series. It was supposed to be earlier this year, like I mentioned before. Um, unfortunately, that couldn't happen in person, but we're, we're happy to be able to do that now over the course of uh, the next four sessions. They're a lot shorter in length than they would have been in person to kind of break it up to allow, to allow you all to, to have um, some time to, to join each one of those and make it not too long for you to sit in front of a computer at any one given point. Um, but there's going to be opportunities to join more of these in the future. So whether whether it's part of this virtual wildlife series being conducted online or hopefully again in person someday soon, um, these, are the these are the four remaining workshops that we have lined up for the future. Um, there's also lots of other opportunities out there that aren't necessarily sponsored by Forest Her, but still provide some opportunities learning for women to be on the lookout for those as well. So now we have a poll question and um, 
Laurel's going to pull this question up for us and you should see a little screen pop up uh, in front of you that asks you, is this your first Forest Her NC event? And uh, if you have attended any of the events last year, either the two topics that I talked about, one of those six lo locations across the state, um, go ahead and put yes if this is your first time joining us. Um, or sorry, other way around, is this your first Forest Her event? Um, if you haven't joined us before, go ahead and put yes. If you've joined us before, put no. We'll just give you a couple of seconds here to fill that out. And it looks like most people have filled that out now. So Laurel has closed the poll and it looks like for majority of you, 60% of you actually, this is your first Forest Herd North Carolina event. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. We appreciate that. And like I said, there's gonna be plenty more opportunities where that comes from in the future. So we hope that this is not your, your last event that you'll be able to join us in the future as well. Okay, so just to show you a little bit for the 40% of you who have joined in the past, um, here's who, who came last time. You can read some of the demographics here, uh, mostly, mostly female. We had almost 500 people attend these first six workshops, so really great attendance. We actually sold out a couple of them and had a waiting list for some of them, so um, they, were, they were very uh, well attended, very popular, and the demographics were kind of, you know, there was a, quite a big range. And we asked, one of the questions we asked is if you are a landowner, how long have you or your family owned the land? So as you can see in the graph here, for some people, they were brand new to owning their land, whereas other people have owned it for generations. So in, in all of the workshops, there were some opportunities to interact, to meet and talk with other women, to share stories, to build relationships. You know, if you want to continue some of those relationships that, that you made at those workshops, please do join that Facebook group that um, Jennifer mentioned, and we can continue some of those conversations as part of that Facebook group. Um, so, uh, yeah, lot, lots of really good opportunity to interact and network at these workshops, and we hope to continue that in the future. So we asked people, and this is a word cloud, if you're not familiar with them, the bigger the word, the more people, the more popular that, that was. And we asked people what the challenge was, uh, what was the biggest challenge you faced regarding your woodlands? And as you can see here, very similar to other studies that have been done, knowledge was actually the biggest challenge. So just not having that, that basic knowledge about maybe how to even start or what to do. Um, so there were, a lot of people that felt that that was their biggest challenge, but as you can see here, there were maybe some specific invasive species or um, just management in general, taxes. So lots of lots of challenges, nothing that can't be overcome, um, and especially knowledge. We're hoping that's one thing that Forest Her North Carolina will actually help with is to give you some of that knowledge um, to provide that, so that it's no that part is actually no longer a challenge anymore. And then we also ask people, what, why do you own your woodlands? What are the top three reasons for owning your woodlands? And this one was also pretty diverse, but wildlife stood out um, kind of from everything else, which again is very similar to other national surveys that have been done. And so the people who attended our workshops also felt like wildlife was kind of one of the main reasons, but also just conservation in general, um, peace, nature, stewardship, preservation. A um, few people, we do see income in there, investment. So all over the board into reasons that people, why people own their land. And we're um, happy to have a diverse group of people and hopefully we'll be able to kind of touch on all of those topics at some point. Okay, and finally, um, we asked people if they felt, and this was in the survey that we asked after the event, did you feel encouraged to attend because it was a woman focused workshop? And we were kind of just curious, um, you know, about what people had to say to that, but it, overall, a lot of people actually said yes. And I won't read through all of these um, quotes right here. You can read through them. Um, these are, are actual 
sentences that people put into their evaluations. And for the most part, though, people did actually attend because it was a women's focus workshop for, as you can read here, lots of different reasons. Um, but mainly it, it, it felt like, um, you know, a, a safe space for people to ask questions and to have a, a, a welcoming environment. And so that's kind of what we were hoping for and um, that we were glad that we were that those programs allowed people to to feel that way and to reach our goal of doing that so with that um i just wanted to thank you all again for joining today hopefully that gives you just a little bit of background about our efforts and if we have any time laurel i'd be happy to take some questions or jennifer So yes, Jennifer, we do have several questions. Um, I think Laurel Case is in the background trying to answer several of those as well, but let's just make these known. So our first question is, is Force Her North Carolina a corporation? It is not a corporation. We are in the process right now of looking into the possibility of becoming a 501c3, which would give us um, that nonprofit status, but at the at the time being, it's just a group of volunteers coming together, and uh, <laughs> that's where it stands right now. Okay, um, and do you have to be a, a woman to join our webinars or join our workshops? Absolutely not. So this is gender inclusive. Um, any way you identify, everybody is welcome. It's just um, the idea being that we want women to have a safe, to feel like there's a place where they can, you know, some of the, some of the topics might be a little bit more geared towards women. Um, and so, you know, you might get a little bit more out of it. Um, and we wanted to create that support network for women, but by no means does that exclude anybody else. So please, we, we welcome anybody to join. Yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, um, we have another question. What is the difference between forest and woodland? It looks like, and of course, we, we, do, in, we do interchange those two terms often. Um, and maybe somebody else, if somebody else wants to take a stab at this in the <laughs> chat box, but really they're interchangeable. Um, it's just been, it, it, landowners tend to identify more with woodlands. Um, really, it's the same thing as, a, as forest. You know, we call ourselves forest her and see, as you can even see on the screen here right now, engaging women in woodland stewardship, but we're forest her. So really, it's the same thing. There's no, there's no difference. That is correct. I think we've got so many survey landowner surveys that came back stating that most landowners did, in fact, identify with the word woodland instead of when we talk about forest or forest land. So you will see most of us interchange those two words quite often. Um, let's see. We have a few more questions for some of the identified birds, and we'll wait for those. Um, I think um, one more thing about recording of our webinars. Uh, where this is this being recorded and where someone can pick this up. I think Laurel has. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, it is being recorded and we will likely share that out through our email channels and then also on the Facebook when it's available. Probably it usually takes a couple days for it to um, download and process and with the captioning and everything, but um, should be available in just a few days. Okay, and one more. Um, how long has Forster, North Carolina been around or when did we form it? Ooh, great question. I, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on this, Jennifer, but I feel like it's been, well, so our first, very first workshop was last August, but we had started talking well before that. I want to say even early, early 2019, I think was maybe our very first meeting where it was kind of like you mentioned before, people just kind of sat around a table and brainstormed about what this could be. Um, so I think it was early 2019, but I'd have to check back in our notes to get a definite date on that. Good question. But it's, new. we're fairly new. Yeah. Yes, most definitely. That sounds about right. We are fairly new and took us a little bit of time to kick off our workshops, but uh, once we started, we were rolling very quickly. Um, so one more question we do have. How can we make a donation to help support Forest Herd North Carolina? 
That is a great question um, that I might let you take a stab at, Jennifer, actually, or if Leslie's on the line, maybe she could type it into the chat box for everybody. Um, one way, and I know Jennifer is going to talk about this later, it's not quite a donation, but we have some fun new swag available now. <laughs> that is a, um, a coffee mug that is available for purchase, and any proceeds from that um, will go to our our forest for NC work. But aside from that, um, that I am not the person to answer that. Um, so perhaps somebody else could provide a, a better response for that in the chat box and we'll definitely get back to to you on that one. Thank you for that offer and for asking that question. Yeah, I think that's a question that we're still trying to uh, really iron out fully. Um, we have accepted some funding for some of our contributors or, or partners from of our forestry consulting firms or agencies or nonprofit groups. Um, but uh, it look, but we can accept them. Of course, we're still working on our uh, nonprofit status, so we've had a lot of support, asked questions about that. Um, but donations in support of Forrester can be sent to, um, we do have an address here in the chat box, Leslie McCormick, who is oversees the NC Tree Farm Program. Um, you can make a check payable to NC Tree Farm. And uh, we realize that that sounds a little different, but because we're not nonprofit, um, the North Carolina Tree Farm Program has offered uh, their accounting to us and are helping us through this process. And so right now you can make a donation to them, but make sure that Forest Her NC is written in the memo line. So um, until we can, can get those other business details ironed out. But thank you so much. Those are great questions. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more. So thank you so much, Jennifer Fawcett. I think we can all see the importance of educating women about land management and our natural resources and the influence that women have, particularly here in North Carolina. Um, as a professional forester myself, I have talked with so many women that, that feel that they don't have enough knowledge about what they should do or, or how to make the decision. Because ultimately the decision about uh, someone's land is up to them. And they're really trying to gather information and feel like they could trust the information. So that's what Forester NC is all about, is all of the different groups, the federal agencies, state agencies here in North Carolina that can help private landowners and nonprofit groups and consulting firms trying to come together and be able to share that information with women across North Carolina. That's what we're looking to change. All right, so without any further questions, we will move on to our next speaker. This is probably the speaker that everyone is excited to get to and hear about. Uh, this will be our first true presentation about managing for wildlife. So Amy Tomcho with Audubon, North Carolina, will be helping us identify birds by sight and sound. So with that, Amy Tomcho, I will let you take it away. Great, thanks Jennifer. Hi everybody. I'm so excited to see everyone here today. Um, I am uh, Audubon North Carolina's conservation biologist and I have been for about seven years. Um, I have uh, been a founding member of the executive board of Forest Her, and I also serve as the mountain workshop leader and um, on a few other committees as well. So um, yeah, this is a, a passion of mine and to see so many of you here today just really warms my heart. Um, I am coming to you live from my home in the mountains of Western North Carolina and uh, as we all work remotely to make all this happen. Um, and I'm excited that we're able to do that now and bringing these virtual presentations to you. So thanks for NC State for supporting um, that programming. Um, sometime in the future, uh, I do hope that we can join together uh, for a bird walk, but I think that you'll find that it's actually very helpful to have a bit of a primer on bird identification in this format to get you started knowing exactly what you're looking for when it comes to birds. It's actually not too difficult to get started, and I bet many of you already have done just that during this quarantine. <laughs> in fact, um, 
electronic bird field guide downloads have more than doubled and eBird users have increased by nearly 80% in the last six months. So it seems a global pandemic is the perfect time to learn how to bird. <laughs> so we will explore tips um, today to help you with bird identification in this presentation. But one of my main messages to all of you is that I hope that you can enjoy birds in whatever way they bring you joy. You don't have to know any of their official names to be fascinated by their behavior, their song, their brilliant or sometimes subtle coloration. For me, birds have always helped ground me um, with a sense of peace when life gets crazy. And my hope is that they can do that for you too. So thanks for joining me today. Um, I'd like just to take a second to dedicate this presentation to my uncle Rick. Uh, he passed away last week he and his wife, Trish, were two of the first people who inspired me to become a biologist. And his last name is also the name of a bird, so it seems appropriate. So thank you, Uncle Rick. <laughs> All right. I'm going to adjust the setting here for just a second. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, E.O. Wilson said, uh, when you have seen one ant, one bird, one tree, you have not seen them all. And I think the same is true for birders. Uh, we are all beautifully unique people. And so when it comes to birding, you can just do you and whatever that looks like is just fine. Of our group here today, I wanted to mention that more than 60% of you identified as beginning birders and um, the other roughly 40% as intermediate. So today I will be laying some of the foundational groundwork for birding by sight and sound. And I'm not going to spend any time talking about birding gear or the best optics because the thing is most of us were born with all the equipment we need, our eyes and our ears. You don't need binoculars to watch birds. As my graduate advisor and friend Drew Lanham says, birding is not what you can ID through binoculars. It's a feeling, an immersive understanding of all that's around, thinking of the history, of the people and of the land. And so as we learn about the birding basics today, I encourage you to remember the parts of birding that we might not talk about in the next hour. The emotions that stir within your soul, the camaraderie of sharing the sighting of a new yard bird with your neighbor, the blessing of seeing life unfolding before your very eyes, the miracle of these feathered messengers that we all call birds. Looking ahead to the main points we will cover in today's presentation, um, we'll talk about where we can find birds. And I'll give you a hint, they're everywhere. We'll talk about the ways bird identification really does make sense. And then we'll dig into some tips and tricks to get you started identifying birds. So birds are everywhere, really, from the rafters of your grocery store to remote old growth swamps. Birds occupy nearly every corner of our planet. We estimate that there are roughly 10,000 species of birds worldwide. In North America, we've identified approximately 2,000 different bird species. The United States, about 1,000. And in North Carolina, we've had almost 500 unique species show up in our state. Here at Audubon, North Carolina, we've been monitoring how those species are surviving and what we can do to help conserve them in the places they need. And here's my message. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I really love being involved in Forest Herd, North Carolina. I believe birds are one of the best indicators of forest health. 
because there's a species for every part of the forest, every layer of the forest, every season, every geography. And we can do a lot uh, to know and help our forests by knowing our birds. So 500 species sounds like a lot to learn, <laughs> and it is. Uh, we're really lucky to live in the one, one of the most biodiverse states in the United States. But don't get overwhelmed because bird identification makes sense. The absolute best advice I can give is to start slow. Watch with wonder. What do you notice about the birds you see? If you're looking at a bird, ask yourself, what stands out about this bird? Does it have floppy feet like a duck? What does its beak look like? Birds evolved to be specialists each in their own way, all 10,000 of them. Here's an example. This is a red crossbill. I'll start by stating the obvious. It's red <laughs> and it has a crossed bill. And indeed, that is how this bird got its name. Red crossbills use this specialized beak to extract small seeds from between the scales of pine cones, which also may be why they tend to hang upside down like this one. So if you saw this bird, your observations might be that it's red, it has a crossed bill, and it's hanging around in evergreen trees. Once you get this far, making basic observations, you're pretty close to naming another bird to your list. So we'll talk about more ways that birding makes sense throughout this presentation. But like these baby pileated woodpeckers, I'm just going to launch us straight into the world of birding. We're going to do that by using our senses. So humans have five senses, but we really only need two of them for bird watching. Seeing and hearing, or sight and sound. I'll go one step further and say you could probably get away with using only one of those two. And there are plenty sight and hearing impaired folks out there who are bird watchers. Using our sight, there are four main keys to bird ID. Size and shape, color pattern, behavior, and habitat. These are the details you can quickly gather whether the bird is sitting outside your window or more or less a flash of flying feathers. Let's look at each of these more closely. This illustration is from an old Peterson guide we had when I was a little girl. Um, it's a great example showing birding tip number one. The size and shape of a bird is the first way you can narrow down what type of bird you're seeing. Because let's face it, you often just get a fleeting glimpse of that bird as it swoops past you. But there are things that you can notice about that experience. Here's what I mean. Say both your mother and father were walking towards you, but there was a glaring sun right behind them and you could only see their silhouettes. Would you know which one was your mom and which one was your dad? Look at this picture. What stands out to you about each of these silhouettes? A long tail? A crusted head? Do you recognize any of these birds? I mean, if you do, that's amazing because we're only looking at silhouettes. But I bet you do see something that might already be familiar to you. See, you're already a birder, <laughs> but don't log off just yet. While some aspects of size and shape may be obvious, like say the comparison between a crane and a hummingbird, this tip can be useful in more specific situations as well. Say you see these two duck-like birds swimming in the lake. What's different about them? Common loons sit low in the water while a ruddy duck sits stout and upright. I mean, just look at his tail. <laughs> So then take these characteristics and pull out your bird book. 
you'll be able to narrow down who's who pretty quickly. Tip number two, color pattern. Now I realize this slide says color pattern and it's in black and white, <laughs> but I wanted to point out the places on a bird that color pattern may be displayed. The complexity of feather density and placement, as well as pigmentation, it's really truly remarkable. And it's a great way to distinguish between two similar species. For example, sparrows can be tough to ID. They're small and often a mix of browns and grays. But if you're seeing a sparrow that has a distinctly white throat, well, it's a white-throated sparrow. See, birding makes sense. Here are a couple more examples using color pattern for identification. The contrast of the dark wings against the bright body of this male scarlet tanager clearly illustrates how color can help identify birds. On the right, this male American kestrel is a good example of both color and pattern characteristics. Find out whatever stands out about the bird you're seeing and go from there when you're trying to identify a new species. I will take a moment here to say that most of the photos that we'll see in this presentation are male birds. Um, at the beginning, um, as a beginning birder, you're likely to see males most often because they tend to be more conspicuous, both in color and song, and frequently in behavior too. Um, but most birds are what we call sexually dimorphic. The females look and sound differently. And in general, their characteristics are more subdued. There are also some seasonal plumage variations um, that as you get more into birding, you may want to dig into with more depth. But if you're just starting out, do not let those details get in your way for now. Let's move on to tip number three, behavior. <laughs> um, I just mentioned that males are often more conspicuous in their behavior, but any bird's behavior can be a great tool you can use to identify what species it is. Just like size, shape, color, and pattern, each bird species has a distinct way it moves, whether it be a mating dance or a feeding ritual. Behavior can be a defining trait. So the way a bird feeds is an important type of behavior. Sparrows frequently feed on the ground, whereas bark foragers, like this red-headed woodpecker on the right, uh, tap on tree branches to find bugs to eat. And here's a behavior tip, especially included for all of us foresters. <laughs> this is a blue jay. Um, males and females look the same, so we're just gonna go ahead and assume this is a shimmery girl bird. <laughs> For today. Um, did you know that blue jays are foresters? Blue jays tend to stash more food than they eat, and they happen to eat acorns, which essentially means they plant oak trees. Thank you, blue jay. <laughs> Breaking apart behavior a little bit more, um, the way a bird flies is also an important trait. Uh, here we see um, how a bird looks in flight, a wingless bird, no, <laughs> it looks like it's wingless, but it's not. Um, what this picture actually shows is what we call a flap flap glide pattern. Um, this pileated woodpecker, uh, the picture has captured the glide part of the flight pattern. There are other birds, like some raptors and finches, that display a similar pattern. And you can't necessarily always see what the wings are doing, but you can see the undulating pattern as their body goes up and down through the air in flight. Um, so this too can be used to help you figure out what type of bird you're seeing. Here's 
Here's another behavioral clue. How does the bird move? Um, you may be thinking I forgot to rotate these photos when I created this presentation, but in fact, these pictures are oriented correctly. Here we have from left to right, a brown creeper, a black and white warbler, and a red breasted nuthatch. Three families, three distinct looks, one major commonality. They walk on the side of tree trunks, <laughs> often upside down. So if you see a bird with this specific locomotion, you have a great tip for identification. So let's cover one more type of behavior. Um, some birds have distinct movement habits. They repeat so frequently, it becomes a defining characteristic. So both the Eastern Phoebe on the left and the Palm Warbler on the right flick or hump their tail when they're perched on a branch. Yes, up close you can clearly see that their plumage markings are different but sometimes all you get to see is the shadow of a bird in a tree. But if it happens to be bobbing its tail, you just eliminated hundreds of other possible identifications. Okay, um, now that we've spent some time on bird behavior, let's move on to birding tip number four, habitat. Habitat is determined by what food, water, shelter, and space birds need to survive. Where are you watching birds? Are you in a meadow, a forest, on the beach? Birds are specialized to what we call niches. Each has a particular habitat configuration they prefer which essentially helps eliminate competition for resources among species. Looking at this illustration, we see that grasshopper sparrows on the left would be found in grasslands where wood thrushes prefer large expanses of mature hardwood forest. We can also see here why maintaining a diversity of habitats is critically important to bird conservation. Habitat also considers elements of a bird's range distribution and what season they spend in that range. So avid birders <laughs> tend to go wild in spring and fall, like now. <laughs> One of the reasons for that is because our part of the, in our part of the world, um, those seasons signify migration for many of our songbirds. So that means that you could see a lot of different species during those times in North Carolina that you wouldn't typically see here other times of the year. Uh, it's because they're on their journey to and from their breeding grounds. So if you see something out of the ordinary, consider that if it's April or mid to late September, in North Carolina, you might see a bird that is more typically found in Canada, which is pretty exciting. So here's an example of the range map of one of my favorite birds, the yellow-billed cuckoo. Widely found in North Carolina, but only in the spring and summer. So if you saw a bird look like this in the winter in say Raleigh, it's probably a different species or a very lost cuckoo. <laughs> so I'm curious uh, where you all prefer to bird when you, if you have been birding, either officially or unofficially. So we do have a little poll question for you. Um, Laurel, can you launch the, oh, yes, she's on it. So um, just choose one and uh, we'll just kind of see where everybody's out birding. Um, I just wanted to take a moment while you're voting to say that if you're birding in a public place, like some of these choices here, um, you can visit uh, ebird.org 
and you can find lists of species detected at or near your preferred birding place. Um, and that helps you narrow down a, a list of possible species that you could see. If you're in your own forest, um, you can find a month and a place close by in eBird uh, to gauge what birds people are people near you are seeing. Um, so thinking about, you know, the, the distribution of us foresters here, here in North Carolina, we are um, located from, from coast to the mountains. And so, you know, you may even think about joining the Facebook group and um, uh, planning a good socially distanced hike with your, with your local forest hers. So, okay, great. So the poll results are in and 77% um, of you like to bird in your own yard or woodlands. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so here's what we've covered so far. Tips for identifying birds by sight. So now let's use our other sense, hearing. Um, the sound a bird makes is a great way to recognize birds. In fact, when ornithologists survey for birds, we do so almost exclusively by sound. Did you know that no two birds sing alike? Really, 10,000 species and no two songs sound exactly alike. It's amazing. To understand how uh, to use sound as a tool for bird identification, you might wonder what motivates them to make that sound. So why do birds vocalize? As a general rule, uh, birds vocalize to communicate in ways that ultimately increase their survivorship. While we can't know all of their intentions, research tells us that for adult birds, it's usually for two main reasons. And if they don't have those reasons, they probably aren't singing or doing whatever it is that makes sound. A bird vocalizes to attract a mate or to establish placement, either as territory boundary or to let others know where each other is in the flock. So once you begin to learn bird vocalizations, your world gains so much depth I mean, think about it. You can only see straight ahead, but you can hear in all directions at once. Learning bird songs is a great way to identify birds hidden by dense foliage, far away birds, birds at night, and birds that look nearly identical to each other. People tend to get overwhelmed when they think about learning to identify bird songs. But looking at this photo, I bet you can almost hear the honking of these tundra swans. Figuring out bird songs can be more obvious than you might think. Just stop and ask yourself what the sound resembles to you. Do you hear something that sounds like a dog's squeaky toy? It's probably a brown-headed nuthatch. Or does it sound more like a squeaky wheel? you're probably hearing a black and white warbler. Don't be afraid to Google birds that sound like a bouncing ping pong ball <laughs> or whatever it is that you think you're hearing. Chances are good that you'll get an answer with a simple web search. Because today's presentation is largely a visual experience, I wanted to share a graphic depiction of bird songs. So I copied this graphic from a website that relates bird song to brain function and behavior in humans. They call that science biopsychology. And it's fascinating. Um, it actually theorizes that human language originally developed from bird song. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but I do know that birds have played a big role in our lives for a very long time. 
for the musical people here, uh, we can use words like rhythm, pitch, and tone to describe bird songs. For the, for the visual people, this image is called a spectrogram. Um, a lot of people like to use this to help identify different bird species songs. If you do gravitate towards that sort of thing, there are some birding applications for your smartphone that will include spectrograms for each species. If you're more fluid in the way that you analyze things, um, you can think in terms of song styles. Here are some common ways that birders describe bird song. We have sing-songers, whistlers, chippers, trillers. Once you get the hang of these descriptors, they will become one of the most effective ways that you can identify birds. For example, if you said to me, hey, Amy, <laughs> the other day I was in Western North Carolina and I heard a bird that said, bee, buzz, buzz. I really wouldn't know exactly what species you were talking about. Remember what we said earlier, birding identification makes sense. So not all bird sounds are songs or calls. On the top of this slide, we have two species that use parts of their bodies, other than their vocal organs, to make noise. Let's watch how this ruffed grouse tries to impress the ladies. And here's a greater sage grouse using air sacs to make sounds. For the hearing impaired, um, I describe the, the rough grouse sound as sounding like a drum. As for the sage grouse, Cornell Lab describes the sound as outlandish. <laughs> Some birders will tell you that the best way to learn bird so song is to actually watch the birds sing. So let's watch a, an example of both a sing-songer and a triller. Here's the blue-headed vireo. And here's the chipping sparrow, call him a triller. Can you hear the difference in the way that they sing? So tomorrow morning at your house, see if you can isolate the different songs you're hearing. Once you start listening more closely, you can begin to know how many different types of birds you're hearing and where they're located. Vireos, for example, tend to hang out around the middle layers of a forest, while sparrows like open ground. You're going to get more comfortable synthesizing clues like these to help you determine the identif identification of birds. So as we get close to the end of the presentation, I, I recognize that you may be getting a little saturated with information. Um, so I wanted to end with a couple easy birding tricks. <laughs> um, so trick number one, we call bird song mnemonics. Mnemonics match the vocalizations of birds with a phrase, as you can see here. 
Somehow our English speaking human brain finds it easier to memorize familiar words and phrases. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, take a look at these examples illustrated by Bird and Moon Comics. And I won't read all of them to you, but I encourage you to come back to this recording and go through these species one by one with actual videos of these species singing that you can find on YouTube or Audubon's online field guide. And see if you can hear these phrases in the respective songs. It's, it's actually pretty neat to begin to understand mnemonics. Not all birds have distinct mnemonics, but if they do, uh, most bird identification applications will include those clues for you. So, and don't underestimate the power of, of art forms like these drawings by Rosemary Mosco. Um, they can be incredibly helpful and wonderful in the most lighthearted way. So let's listen to two of these songs. Um, this is the black-throated green warbler. It's actually one of the first warblers I learned. Can you hear the trees, trees, murmuring trees? <laughs> and here's the oven bird who emphatically says, teacher, teacher. And if that trick wasn't enough, I've got an even better one up my sleeve for you. Namesayers. Yes, friends, these birds just straight up tell you what their name is. Here we see the Eastern Tohi on the left. Um, some of you also know this bird as the drink your tea bird. Let's listen. <laughs> And in the middle, we have the Eastern Wood Peewee. Peewee. And finally, the Eastern Whippoorwill. So it may seem overwhelming at first, um, but try to use the methods you learned today to learn just one or two species at a time. And maybe you even want to look at birds you already know, um, like our state bird, the Northern Cardinal, sometimes called the red bird. Um, apply the concepts that we talked about today to practice. And I bet you discover something new about those common species too. Just remember to enjoy the journey. One of the best ways to learn about birds is to spend time with other birders. And so I, will, I hope you will consider um, joining one of your local Audubon chapters. You can find the location of those chapters on our website at nc.audubon.org. Um, Audubon also has a birding app for smartphones as seen on the right side of the slide, and it's free. Um, so you can search for it in your phone or tablet's app store. Um, and finally, believe it or not, this presentation included 73 different bird species. So you're already birding. <laughs> all, of, all but three of those uh, can, can be found right here in North Carolina at some point during the year. So if you're curious about what birds you were seeing, And I apologize for the really small type, <laughs> but here are all the, the photo credits um, from this presentation. 
And I always like to add this because um, it's really thanks to amazing photographers that contribute their work to Audubon um, that we can have beautiful presentations like this. So if you do practice this hobby, please consider sharing your art with us um, so we can show it off in presentations like this. Um, finally, uh, in true Forest Her fashion, if you have been with us in person in the past, um, all of our presentations usually had a quiz at the end. And just because I can't see all your smiling faces <laughs> doesn't mean I'm not going to put you to the test. So um, Laurel, can you bring up that last poll question? Which name saying bird also says, drink your tea, Cast your votes now. I'll add that um, I think we're going to have a little bit of time for questions, but I think uh, what I really love to see is if you do have a favorite bird. Um, if you want to go ahead and type it into the chat box so we can share all that fun information. And when you type into the chat box, um, go ahead and select the drop down menu that says all panelists and attendees. And I think we'll all be able to see those. So if you know that, don't worry about spelling or exact name, but if you have a favorite bird or a bird that stands out in your memory, go ahead and type that into the chat box. And we are looking good. You guys have all passed the test. <laughs> Eastern Tohi says Tohi and drink your tea. Nice job, everyone. Okay, so thanks again for joining this presentation. Um, absolutely love to see so many of you here with us and hope we'll be able to join together in person real soon. So um, that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. See if I can open the chat and see what you're Jennifer doing. Roach, were you going to moderate the questions or do you want me to? Yes, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I was sitting here talking to myself. Um, yes, that was great, Amy. Thank you so much. There are many questions. Um, we'll start with what was the name of the Audubon app that you had spoken about? Um, Audubon has a, a national app that you just type in Autom Audubon Bird Guide and it'll pop up. Audubon actually sponsors um, lots of wildlife field guides as well. Um, we have mammals and um, maybe, I don't even remember all the different ones we have, but um, it should pop up if you type it into your search box for the, for the app store, but it's free. Okay. Um, what was one of the most rarest birds that you have seen? Oh. <laughs> Um, you got to pick one, only one. <laughs> I know that's so hard. Um, so I had a wonderful, when I first started birding, uh, I happened to be in the great state of Florida, which is so diverse. And we were on the hunt uh, for a snail kite. And um, we, we actually were able to find a few down near the Everglades. And that was um, really spectacular. Uh, if, you, if you don't know, they're named because they rely on um, snails for their food. And um, the snails were declining for a long time and they were um, on a, a, the endangered species list and um, have recovered to some degree. So we may be able, if you ever go to Florida, you may be able to see more of them than when I was there 20 years ago. But um, that's just one, so hard to pick, but that's just one. Okay. Um, where did you say, or where did you get the bird song cartoons from? Maybe a, a website or a book or what is the best way maybe they could learn some of those bird songs and calls? 
Yeah, well, all of the um, apps that you can get for your smartphone will have um, different versions of each bird species song. And they also have the calls. Um, they have done a really good job of um, including similar species as well. So if there's another bird that sounds similar or looks similar, it'll give you some suggestions. So those, I mean, you know, frequently um, people use the, the applications. Now, uh, back in my day, uh, I had um, CDs and even cassette tapes that I had to rewind and play and rewind and play. And I think you can still find those. Um, the CDs are a good option if you don't use that smart technology. And, um, but they have uh, a, a number of different options for that. And, you know, happy to help you search for something if you're looking for something that meets your needs. Some um, of those applications are free and some do cost a little money. Uh, bird song okay. car cartoons. Um, oh, maybe that was the question. <laughs> um, the cartoons, you can search for bird and moon comics. And that's um, a singular artist uh, whose name is Rosemary Mosco, M-O-S-C-O. Okay. All right, is there a, somewhere that uh, folks could submit their bird photos? Yes, um, you can send them to me. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, we have just, you know, we definitely um, follow all the um, um, copyright laws. And what we do is we have a national database that all 700 or however many of our Audubon employees um, have access to that when we do presentations like this, um, that we can, we can tap into those with your permission. So I can get that started if you have some amazing photos you'd like to share. And um, closer to home, we also use those, those photos on our North Carolina social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, web page. So yes, I would love if you send those to me. Okay, um, and we're gonna do one more. We have a lot of questions for you, Amy. You generate a lot of questions, so we've got some good ones, but uh, we're gonna do one more. And then um, I think maybe if we could move some of those questions, if people can stay afterwards and do the after meeting, maybe we could get a few more answered. Um, but can you talk a little more about immersive listening? Uh, we have a person who is more visual and would like to find more patterns in what they hear. They're okay. Um, they're more visual and want to hear more patterns. Yeah. Well, the, like I said in this in the slideshow, where I would really start is isolating the different sounds you hear. Um, the, these birds, I, you can read about the vocal cords of some birds like wood thrushes and stuff. It's really spectacular, um, but they all sound a little different. And that's one of the miracles of birds. So you can isolate different patterns in their song. You can isolate different tones um, and, you know, what layer of the forest they're coming from. How high are they? Um, are they soaring through the sky? Um, and then as you start to kind of separate that by really, I mean, yeah, go sit in your woods and close your eyes really, and just um, listen to all the different sounds you're hearing and where they're coming from, and then pick one or two and see what it sounds like to you. Um, you know, like it does it sound like a bouncing ping pong ball. That's what field sparrows sound like, <laughs> um, things like that. And uh, if you have some, you know, individual questions about different IDs. There's um, several different places that you can go. I, I know some of you said you're not a big fan of Facebook, but Facebook has bird identification pages that help birders learn birds. Um, so when you have that weird question that, you know, like I'm hearing something um, and I just saw it fly by and it has a black spot on its cheek, you know, they can be like, oh, well, that's, you know, red cockaded woodpecker or whatever. Um, so there are a lot of resources. And if you have specific questions about those resources, I'm, I'm happy to help on an individual basis as well. Okay, and um, I, I think I lied there. Well, if you could answer one more question, um, where is 
can someone go to get help identifying some of the birds that they may see or hear on their property? Um, should they go to Audubon, their local chapter, or should they go to a state agency? What's the best way to get help that comes to their property? Yeah, I do. I think Audubon chapters are a really great resource because um, these are people who volunteer and have time uh, and they love, I mean, they're just absolutely passionate about birding. And so uh, while your state agencies uh, do, they, we all have good staff available, we're usually stretched a little thin for individual outreach. And that's where those chapters um, come in. And typically they have monthly meetings. We have 10 chapters across the state of North Carolina. Um, a couple of those are student chapters at universities, which is also fun. Um, but uh, they you typically would have monthly meetings. A lot of those folks have taken them online now. So you can kind of um, lurk in the background and see if you like the kind of the feel of that and then reach out. Um, really, these are these are all wonderful outgoing folks who um, would do most anything to be able to get out and bird with somebody and introduce them to to that new science for them and, and passion. So um, start there. NC.audubon.org uh, has a map of our state chapters. Um, national, if you're tuning in outside of the state, um, we've got a map of the national chapters on our national page, which is just audubon.org. Great, that is great. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I think I am gonna cut us all off because we have a, just a few more slides, um, but we have, have a lot of questions, uh, generated a lot of questions, Amy. And um, so this was great. I think we definitely learned there's a couple of good birding apps out there, the Merlin app, the eBird, um, so different ways to help. And uh, I think Amy is definitely saying, surround yourself with other people that enjoy birding and trying to identify birds and listen to bird calls. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, there we go. So um, thank you for that. Um, for those of us that are still sticking with us today, we hope you have enjoyed this meeting and to know that this is one of the, the first few meetings. We'll see how three more. Uh, we have a meeting in October on October 8th. And at that meeting, it'll be the same format. It'll be an hour and a half virtual meeting. We will talk about invasive plants and we will have a second speaker talk about using native landscaping. And you can see how, uh, how using native landscaping is very important. Uh, we have a second meeting coming up in November, November 12th, where we will talk about managing your woods for wildlife versus managing your fields for wildlife. Uh, there is a, is a difference. So uh, that, com that uh, meeting will provide a lot of information for us. Um, the third one will be December 10th, and we will discuss human wildlife interactions as well as identifying wildlife by tracks and markings. So we hope that you will definitely consider joining us for the next three meetings and, um, and uh, hopefully look for a time where we can come together in person or do maybe a birding hike or a field tour. So uh, please add these virtual meetings to your calendar and uh, we'll look for updates through your email or through Facebook or other social media and uh, look forward to hopefully you can join us again then.